I would say I have no idea what to say, but that would be an absolute lie. Um, so I do want to say before I start anything is to just to recognize the incredible career of Dale Rosselet. So please, everybody, give Dale. <laughs> And I have to thank three people without whom I would not be here this evening. Number one, of course, is my wife, Dorothy. Uh, it was she who, yes, okay. It was in January of 1999 when she decided that we could live on one salary for about six months. And so she gave me those six months as a gift that I can never repay. Because within those six months, I found the way to get into the career, to get into the field that has become my career and my absolute love, uh, to work in the environmental field. Um, and second, the person uh, who gave me that opportunity to work with him, to be my mentor, Captain Bill Sheehan, Hackensack Riverkeeper, uh, since 1997. I showed up in his office in 1999 and said, hey, so, you need any help? And then after about 27 minutes, he goes, yeah, I do need help. So it started with that. But the person who really in many ways brought the, the two things together, my wife's wonderful gift and Captain Bill's ability to find me the work was somebody who unfortunately cannot be with us this evening, and that's the late, great Tom Gilmore of New Jersey Audubon. Sitting in his desk, sitting at his desk, um, over multiple cups of coffee and at least an entire box of donuts, you know, he says to me, you know, you should talk to Bill Sheehan. He's got a lot going on. I think he might need a hand. Well, boy, if anybody ever gave anybody advice, that was the advice that I needed. And uh, my wife, my boss, and the late Mr. Gilmore, bless them all, they're the best. Um, so I want to just uh, finish up with a little bit of uh, the two things, the, the people for whom this award is, is an honor of, we cannot rightfully give them all the credit that they deserve. Uh, Pat Kane essentially defined what environmental education is in New Jersey and beyond New Jersey. Uh, she founded, co-founded the Alliance for New Jersey Environmental Education. She taught us all and gave us like the foundation of how to teach environmental education at every level. The level of my grandchildren, two, pre-K, four years old, to adults. Uh, environmental educators in New Jersey do it all for everyone. Uh, incredible. And it was, uh, it was Rich Kane who mentored my boss back in those early, early days before he was Hackensack Riverkeeper when New Jersey Audubon gave Rich the okay to do a study of the bird life of the Hackensack River watershed. And that study, funded and published by New Jersey Audubon, gave us, in those early important dangerous years, the proof to show the naysayers how important the New Jersey Meadowlands and the Hackensack River watershed were to the wildlife, in particular the bird life, of our corner of New Jersey. And there was some extreme times when those 36 pages of that report were all that stood in between the protection of the Meadowlands and their ultimate destruction. And fortunately, um, thanks to Rich, we won. And it was Rich Kane who said to Captain Bill Sheehan, you know, Bill, you could do this. <laughs> There's a market for this here. Right? People will want to go out and, and see the Meadowlands the way you see it. And, and he was so right. And, and she was so right in knowing that the time was right to show people how to educate. And together, they have left a legacy that we all continue to this day. This incredible organization under Alex's leadership um, is just continuing to do incredible work all across the state with people everywhere, every, every sanctuary, at every event. So last thing I want to say to you is I want to give you all um, a challenge. It's a simple challenge, it's not hard, it's not difficult, it's not like you don't have to get X amount of species tomorrow, no, no, no. Um, that would be easy actually. But anyway, no, here's the thing. What we ha all have to do is, as Alex said, take what we're from this weekend, take everything and the people you're talking to and you're learning from everyone, your brothers and sisters in conservation, and when you get home, 
contact your members of Congress, contact your state legislators, let them know that you, a constituent, care about the nature, whether you're here in New Jersey or whichever state you're from, what, 33, I think it was? Incredible. Go back home and contact them, give them a call, write them a letter. Uh, and if you live within reasonable distance of Washington, D.C., go there. It's not difficult, okay? It's not hard. The, on every single door and every congressional office says the same thing. Welcome, please come in. And if you are a constituent of that member of Congress, they will talk to you if they're there. Even better, make an appointment and speak with the legislative assistant who handles environmental issues for that member of Congress. They need to hear from us. They hear from a lot of people who don't understand or appreciate or value wildlife and wild places the way we all do. They need to hear from us in our way of doing things, in our way of understanding, so that we can hopefully get the good stuff done. So um, on that note, I will just finally say thank you once again for everything. We do it for not just the, the joy of birding and the joy of getting out uh, in, into uh, nature, but for the young people among us. There's several young people today. Mark's daughter's here. My grandkids are here. I saw a couple of other young people here. You got kids, grandkids. That's why we do it, for all of them. So thank you once again for this incredible board. I cannot thank you enough. Keep up the great work, and we'll see you in the field. Thank you. so many people involved that need to be thanked um, so I'm gonna take care of a few of those uh, needs right now so um, first off I'd like to acknowledge uh, Lillian uh, Armstrong and Shannon DeAngelis our special events team so please give them a big Adele Schwader, I know she's in the building uh, somewhere, and Jessica Chiristolian and Scott Barnes from our education our team. Adele is the program coordinator. Uh, Tom Reed, our migration count coordinator. Uh, I don't think he's ever going to make it, but uh, he's the one managing all those sites you've been visiting. Uh, our retail staff, who's so involved in taking care of things over at Convention Hall, Brian Moscatello, Carrie Ann Sliderback, Deb Shaw. Uh, Renee Buccina handling some of those things behind the scenes. Um, yeah. Let's not forget our New Jersey Audubon Development and Communications Departments, the uh, Stewardship and the Research Departments. I know Karen Sharp down here always doing a lot for us, making this event happen. And then I know we have a few of our seasonal staff here, so if we could get them to stand for a moment here. We have our uh, George Myers naturalist, Sally Wolbach uh, is in the house. Um, we have colors, banders, interpreting naturalists, runner field naturalists. They're the ones doing all the work out there. And then, of course, we couldn't do this without the incredible core of volunteers, which Alex already acknowledged, but they deserve many, many, many thanks. So if you're one of those naturalists, one of those indoor volunteers at Convention Hall or the Grand, please stand. You deserve it. <laughs> Need to thank the Grand and also the Lower Regional High School, um, and especially theater manager Don Dreschen for all the work that they do um, to allow us to have these events, um, and also our many vendors presenters that also kind of fill out that full schedule that we're able to offer you. 
I want to once again acknowledge our gold sponsors, which are so critical uh, to us being able to do this. Koa, Leica, Swarovski, Vortex, um, and Zeiss. All of them had uh, important components of this festival. I hope you were able to take advantage of those. Um, but even more, the support they give us allows us to do the education and research that we need to keep doing. Uh, we also have some bronze uh, sponsors, the Borough of Avalon who not only supports this festival, but also built the Sea Watch Shack out there on the beach between 8th and 9th in Avalon. So, yeah, great. Cape Resorts and the Rusty Nail uh, for the kickoff party, and New Jersey Southern Shore uh, for uh, all they do for promoting this region as a, as a tourist destination. And then last but not least, all of you our registrants, our members, our supporters, thank you, because what you're experiencing here, which I'm hoping is a whole lot of fun, is also helping us to do that work that we need to do. So thank you. All right. Now I have the, the fun job. And there's a lot to say, so I'm just gonna roll through it, and I know what all that I'm gonna say isn't gonna sum up uh, all that should be said, but it's my utmost pleasure to be able to introduce tonight's speaker, someone whose efforts have aided and inspired me and countless others uh, on my journey with birds. And while I don't have the time to adequately sum up his contributions to conservation and ornithology, here are some highlights, some of them in his own words, to set the stage for tonight. The sea has always been a huge part of, part of his life. His interest in seabirds began in the 1950s, and he spent his formative years in a busy small fishing port on the southern coast of southwest England. It was the perfect start for a life that would be filled with epic adventures, coupled with endless travel and research in the pursuit of his greatest love, seabirds. Birds that live where others cannot, over, on, and in the open ocean. In 1972, he embarked on an 11-year project the first seven of which were spent driving a Land Rover around the world, visiting the major seabird sites of Europe, Africa, Australia, and the Americas, from the Arctic to the Antarctic. Much of that time was as a deckhand aboard trawlers and prey fishing boats, where seabirds could be studied and sketched at close range. Four more years were needed to prepare the plates, texts, and maps. Seabirds, an identification guide, was published in 1983 by Christopher Helm to immediate acclaim. It was named Best Bird Book of the Year by the journal British Birds and published in several languages. The modern seabirding movement had started. The rush to the sea had begun. In the 40 years that have passed, there have been a dramatic increase in the number of people interested in and experiencing seabirds, and much of it due to Peter's work. In the 1980s, he, moved, he worked more and more as a wildlife guide, and in the early 1990s became a founder and partner of Seagram Expeditions, based in Seattle. The company would eventually become the best small expedition company in the world. A memorable achievement was landing a ski-equipped Boeing DC-3 on top of a mile-long, crevasse-riddled Antarctic iceberg in a quest to camp with emperor penguins south of the Antarctic Circle. And to top it off, it was at this time that he met Shirley Metz, who in 1989 had become the first woman to ski overland to the South Pole. They would later marry and settle near Seattle and in Land's End, Cornwall. Peter became increasingly involved in conservation causes, including raising awareness and funds to eradicate rats from Henderson Island. Then came the start of saving South Georgia with the South Georgia Heritage Trust and Friends of South Georgia. In 1995, he was invited to Buckingham Palace to meet Her Majesty the Queen, who awarded him a member of the Order of the British Empire for services to the world of natural history. He was also raising funds for conservation through the sale and auctioning of his art. The interest in seabird conservation as the most threatened bird group on the planet triggered an increasingly desperate rush to conserve imperiled species, sometimes comprised of just a few pairs. He did not imagine that after he described 107 tube-nosed species in 1987, that number would now be upwards of 170 species. Including, including newly described taxa such as the Pincoa storm petrel. P 
Peter has written and illustrated over a dozen books. His latest, Seabird's New Identification Guide, published in 2021, and we'll have them available afterwards, um, and Peter will be able to sign, is a comprehensive guide to the world's 434 seabird species, a presentation of the many changes and new information gleaned over many years of research and travel, a legacy of his love and passion of the ocean and its birds. And tonight, he's going to open our eyes to the world of albatrosses. So without further ado, I'm honored to present Peter Harrison. Well, good evening everybody. It's nice to be here. I was last here and around uh, 41 years ago. I had a very good friend, Alan Brady. Some of you might remember Alan. And we shared many adventures together all around the world, but particularly along the west coast of South America and then south to Antarctica. So I've been itching to get back. And thanks to the perseverance of Lillian, we made it uh, eventually uh, through the years of COVID. And, uh, here I am, uh, ready to give another talk to you all here this evening. If you look at the screen, you'll notice we have Ocean Nomads. That's the title of our lecture here this evening, but the subtitle is simply The Albatrosses. The open ocean is to birds what space is to mankind. It's the last huge environment that birds have to cross or to encounter. The open ocean is rough and unforgiving. And if you look at the world, we live in a misnamed place. The world is two thirds ocean and only a third land. So maybe we live on a misnamed planet. For those of you that are sea going people, you will know that it is possible to be hundreds, sometimes even a thousand miles from the nearest point of land. You can go to the rails of a ship, you can look seawards, and you can see a bird. But these, these are not normal birds. These are not crows, they're not robins, they're not sparrows. These are seabirds. And there are some 430 or so species of seabirds in the world. And in that 400 or so species, there is one group that stands out as something significant, something really special. A group that should take hold of your heartstrings and give them a solid tug. And these, of course, are the albatrosses of the world. The albatrosses of the world are the largest of all flying birds. And, as I say, are very, very uh, special indeed. What I would like to do here this evening is to share with each and every one of you some of my own albatross encounters that I've gained over the last 50 or even 60 years. And hopefully I will instill in you some of that same awe, some of that same wonderment, some of that same attachment, enchantment that I have when working with albatrosses. In reality, albatrosses are not just birds. These are the monarchs of the bird world. If you look at wingspan, albatrosses are the largest of the flying birds in the world. Some of them have wingspans of over 12 or so feet. If you look at how long they live, they live as long as anybody in this room, sometimes 60, 70, 80 years of age. And if you look at their wanderings, there is no bird that flies further than an albatross. Albatross, quite simply, are the oldest known birds and they're the most uh, traveled and itinerant bird species on Earth. They are, in fact, monarchs, but their kingdom is not one of castles, of meadows, of hillsides. Their kingdom is one of the water, vast expanses of ocean that some, in some places do girdle the earth. And this is where their home really is, the open ocean. And they often travel these vast distances from one side of the world to the other. Let's start asking ourselves some questions. Questions like how many albatross species are there? Where do we find them? Where do they get that name? Uh, these, uh, of course, will be known by some of you. And if you look at 
our name of an albatross, the name of uh, an albatross, easily uh, uh, traced. Many of you know that the British had a great navy at one point, not so great these days, but at one point a great navy, and they followed the Portuguese and the Spanish. And it was the Portuguese and Spanish which gave the English language many of its nautical terms. And these nautical terms were passed on then to the Brits, who sometimes corrupted them. And so it should come as no surprise that our first albatrosses were really called Alcatraz. You've all heard of Alcatraz, it's Portuguese for the pelican. And it's a corruption of two words, Arabic words. And those two Arabic words simply meant bucket mouth. And if you think of a pelican, it is bucket mouth. It holds about five gallons of water. You might not have known that, but they hold about five gallons of water in a pouch. And so Alcatraz became Alca, uh, Alcatraz, and that was uh, in the 1600s. The very first time we could look in the English language and we can find the word albatross as it is spelled now is in the diaries of one John Fryer. And in 1672, he was rounding the Cape of Good Hope, and he talks eloquently, or wrote eloquently in his diaries, of these huge black and white birds that followed the ship without as much as a beat of their wings. These were the albatrosses, and that was the first mention in the English language. Nowadays, of course, albatrosses are known as birds of myth and legend. And this has been helped by such poems as the rhyme of the ancient mariner, where that one unfortunate sailor who murdered the albatross was then forced to sit with an albatross around his neck. And just let me tell you folks, that that means you had a 25 pound bird around your neck. And there's nothing that smells worse than a dead sea bird. Let me just tell you that. And if you ever suffer from seasickness, do not get close to these, these birds. So these are the albatrosses of the world. This is me some 55 years, 60 years ago. And yes, I was young once. These days I'm not quite so young, but I'm still spry for my age and can still get up a cliff faster than most, especially if there's an albatross at the top of that cliff. Now, when I came down to the Southern Ocean, life in general was pretty simple. Life, uh, uh, simple, but the taxonomy, not quite so simple, but still a lot more simple than it is today. When I came down here, this was the order, the old order. There were supposedly 13 species of albatross in the world. And I looked at this and I was a young man. I'd already decided to write a book. As Brett had said, I had a Land Rover. I traveled around the world for seven long years, some of the best years of my life, going from country to country, place to place. But the more I looked at the taxonomy of albatrosses, the more confused I became. There were things that definitely did not make sense. Um, and if you look, for instance, at wandering albatross up the top here, there were one wandering albatross shown here, two royal albatrosses shown here, and these were supposedly subspecies. Over here we had the shy albatrosses, four subspecies. We had two sub sub subspecies of black browed albatross, uh, and it just didn't make sense. These birds were measurably different. They were different colors. They had breeding islands that were different. They had migration patterns that were different. They were obviously species. So I decided that when I wrote my first book, Seabirds, an identification guide, this was published in 1983, as Brett said. And in that book, I became something of a heretic because I said, 13 species of albatross makes no sense whatsoever. These birds are good species, and we should increase the species of albatross, the number. And so I increased, added about four or five birds, and ended up not with 13, but with 18 species of albatross. Some people thought I'd gone too far, some people thought I hadn't gone far enough. But the more I looked at this, I then said to myself, you know, as the years passed, I should have gone further. There are more species of albatross, cryptic species hiding within species. And this is a term you might have heard of quite a bit, the cryptic species. So when I was then approaching the age of 60, when most people are thinking of retirement and sitting in a rocking chair or something like that, I said, was that it? Is that all am I going to do in life? I can't do that. I must do more. I'm going to rewrite my book. And so a few years ago, 2021, 
my new book was eventually published, Seabirds, the New Identification Guide. Some of you out there might think that this is a repeat. This is a, a book where I've just revised certain, certain parts of it. Let me tell you, the first book had 420 or so pages. This book has got 600 pages. The new, new book has 239 plates. The old book only had 88. The old book only also had 1,600 color illustrations. This book has 3,284, and I know because I painted most of them. So this is a brand new book, and in there, I decided to go for it and to add further to the albatrosses. So instead of 18 albatrosses, we now have 22 species of albatross, and I'm actually working, I hate to say this, on making another two new species. But that might have to be for the next new book, who knows. So this is the new treatment. And the new treatment, in the old days we had just one wandering albatross. We split that into Antipodean, Tristan and Amsterdam. So out of one species we now have four, and out of one species of royal albatross we now have two. So this is the new treatment for our great albatrosses. Many of you know that the smaller albatrosses called mollymocks, we'll get onto that in a moment, but we have a new genus, and that new genus is now Thalassarchi, which means rulers of the sea. And these smaller albatrosses are definitely the rulers of the sea. You can see the shy albatrosses up there, and the shy albatross, that little group has been split now into four species. The black brown albatrosses into two species, and the Indian and Atlantic yellow nose split into two species. And that, of course, is important to Cape May because I heard there was once a yellow-nosed albatross here that was seen flying over high streets and whatever parkways and um, the main roads. And some people even chased it on motorbikes and all sorts of things. And, of course, that would have been the Atlantic yellow-nosed uh, and not the Indian yellow-nosed. So that's our smaller albatrosses. The two primitive albatrosses, which are the Fabetria, light-mantled and sooty albatross, these birds uh, have not been added to, and so we just have two of those. And then last but not least, if you're not a bird watcher, most people will see their first albatross at the Galapagos Islands, because the Galapagos Islands is where many, many people go because it's on their bucket list. And they just happen to get lucky, and they'll go to Hood Island, uh, and they'll, they'll run into albatrosses. But you must go between March and December. And this is where most people fall in love with albatrosses when they see the first wonderful antics of these birds doing their uh, wonderful displays. And all albatrosses have bizarre displays. You could fall in love with albatrosses just by the way they dance or the way they call. They are so wonderfully energetic and, and, and actually funny when they are displaying. So these are the Fabastria. If you look at Laysan, Black-Footed, and Short-Tail, all three of those species breed on North American or USA soil, out of places like Midway and the Lion Islands. Um, and then the waved albatross, the birds you can see in the photograph on the left, those are the only truly tropical albatross in the world. And they nest on the Galapagos, a small island off the coast of Ecuador, and do actually go down into the Humboldt Current. Um, but other than that, uh, they don't move very far. So these birds are northern albatrosses, and those four are the only four that are found in the northern hemisphere. The others, uh, the other 18 species, are found where I'll be heading in just two weeks from now, and that's back down to Antarctica. And by the way, I've been to Antarctica over 200 times. I stopped counting at 200. Uh, just didn't seem to be any point, because in the end, folks, as you probably gather, the race is only ever against yourself. So, the Southern Ocean is where 18 of the 22 species of albatross currently reside. For those of you that have been there, down to the places like the Drake Passage or to the Antarctica, you will know that this is the windiest belt of ocean in the world. This is the Southern Ocean. This is where waves can be 40, 50, 60 feet high, can damage ships, and this is where albatrosses evolved some 40 or so million years ago. The early mariners gave these areas, these latitudinal belts, wonderful names. The Roaring Forties, the Furious Fifties, and the Screaming Sixties. And this is where albatrosses, as I say, evolved some 40 or so years ago. 
To manage these huge waves and storms, they have to be good, accomplished at navigation and sailing, but also the consummate masters of aerodynamics. These are huge waves, huge seas, and winds generally blow at 50 to 60 knots on most days. In fact, we don't normally talk about the weather until it reaches 50 knots. Uh, uh, not the sort of thing that many people would like to go out in, but this is where the albatrosses live. The largest of them all is the wandering albatross. Now, if there's New Zealanders in the hall tonight, they'll probably argue that no royals are the biggest. You know, that's not the way it is. Most countries will always think that they have the biggest birds or the biggest cars. The same with North Americans. They always think they've got the largest birds. You're going to say to me about condors. Condors are not larger than albatrosses. They are smaller, wingspan-wise. And so this is the wandering albatross. Wingspan of about 12 feet, and they weigh up to about 25 pounds when they are fully adult males. So this is the wandering albatross. The royal albatross, a little bit smaller on average. Um, wingspan, normally between 10 and a half to 11 and a half feet. But both of these are part of the three great albatrosses. And this is the white-backed albatross. And these are immensely strong, powerful birds. This is a male, by the way, a male wandering albatross. It weighs in at about 25 pounds or so in weight and, um, and normally requires a fairly good wind to take it off. The smaller albatrosses are only about half the size of the great albatrosses. Still big birds, um, around about six feet or so from uh, wingtip to wingtip, weigh in around with about uh, eight to nine, 10 or 11 pounds. They're often called molly monks, and that's a corruption of two Dutch words, molly meaning foolish and mok meaning dull. And these birds are the most numerous of our albatross species. Um, this is the black grout. There are between 700 and 800,000 of these, and most of these nest on the Falkland Islands. So for those of you that have been south, you would have certainly seen black grout albatrosses. Easily towed because of that yellow bill, and the white head, and those very, very wide, dark underwing margins. They get their name from this brow that passes over and through the eye, and this is the black browed albatross, one of the most numerous birds and easily seen because they have ship following habits. A close cousin to the black browed is this bird, much more colorful, much more dainty, a bit smaller than the black browed. This is the gray headed albatross, and the gray headed albatross has a beautifully colored bill, yellow ridges on the top and bottom, black on the center, and a slightly reddish blush towards that wonderful tip. And look at that lovely mascara uh, on the eye and that white eyelid that's underneath that, that dark eye. So these birds sit around places like South Georgia. There are 86,000 of these in terms of pairs, and about half of those breed on South Georgia. And they breed not once every year, but twice, uh, once every two years, uh, whereas black grouse breed annually. So there are some differences in biology. When you walk around in South Georgia, which I believe most people should do at some stage in their lives, um, uh, you to look at these birds, and it is so wonderful to be able to get so close to these birds. They sit on their ledges. They don't take any notice of you whatsoever. They are completely fearless and they sit like pieces of fine, hand-painted French porcelain on their green, lovely ledges of South Georgia. So we've said that there are 22 species of albatross, so how can we be sure? What defines an albatross? What makes an albatross an albatross and not something else? For those of you that are beginning birders, you will often look at pattern and color and also um, disregard things like structure, and it's the structure that's important. So when we define an albatross, we should maybe ask the question, why isn't this kelp gull, Dominican gull from the southern hemisphere, why isn't this bird an albatross? If you look at it, it's the same color, the same pattern as an albatross. It has a yellow bill, it has a white head, it has dark underwing margins, uh, a, Black browed albatross is not that different. A black browed albatross has the same yellow bill, it has dark curved marks along the edges of the wings, and it has a mostly white underbody. Well, we look at structure, which, as I say, is very important.
but the head is, of the bird is where we get the most information. You would not expect a woodpecker to have the bill of an eagle and vice versa. It's just not going to work. So if you look at the bill of a gull, a bill of a gull on the top mandible, the upper mandible and the lower mandible, we have one continuous horny plate. And then there's a simple hole knocked in the top of the bill and that's where the bird breathes when the bill is closed like this. If you look at an albatross, an albatross has a very, very different bill. Just look at the lines on the bird's bill. Look at this wonderful hook bill tip that it has to the bill. And uh, if you look and count these plates, you'll come up with about seven different plates that are fused together. So does that mean that any bird with a fused bill, with lines on its bill, is an albatross? Is this an albatross? No, it definitely is not an albatross. It would like to be an albatross. It has fusion lines on its bill, but it lacks the one thing that uh, albatrosses have that these other birds don't have. And that's a set of these, a set of nostrils. And in albatrosses, and it doesn't matter whether you are a wandering albatross, whether you are a black-browed albatross, or whether you are a colorless albatross, you're going to have a set of nostrils. But it's the way that the nostrils are arranged that is important. Because albatrosses have nostrils that are placed one on one side of the bill and the other on the other side of the bill. So this is very unusual. For those of you that are grade A students, you will know that albatrosses are part of the Purcell reformes. Albatrosses are birds that are tube-nosed birds. All of the other tube-nosed birds have the bill in a slightly different uh, uh, manner. And for those of you that have been to the south, you would have seen this bird. And this is a southern, sorry, yeah, southern giant petrel. And if you look there, all other petrels have the two nostrils united and placed in a single tube along the top of the bill. And it doesn't matter whether you're a storm petrel, a shearwater, a diving petrel, a, a gadfly petrel, or a giant petrel, you'll have nostrils that are fused together. And this is very, very different than albatrosses. So albatrosses are the only marine-going birds in the world with divided nostrils, one on the left and one on the right. So it's true to say that all albatrosses are petrels, but not all petrels are albatrosses, just on the structure of the bill. And out of something like 10 and a half to 11,000 species of birds in the world, there are only 22 that have nostrils that are divided. And that's what distinguishes for us what the albatross is. So albatrosses are sea-going birds with divided nostrils, and they are the largest of the Priscilla reformes, and that's a group of about 140 to 150 bird species. They do share certain habits with the other petrels of the, the group. To start with, oops, let me go back. To start with, they have the nostrils attached here to the eye and the salt gland, so that when they do actually take in lots of salt water, the salt is taken out and then runs down the nostril and then down the bill. So they all have very developed salt glands. In fact, the most developed salt glands of any birds in the world. Also, they only ever lay one egg at a time. That's a feature of the tube nose. Doesn't matter what you are, storm petrel, shear water, albatross, you only lay one egg at a time. Some of the bigger ones, like Wandering and Royal, only breed once every two years because they have a very, very long breeding season that we'll go into in a moment. So these birds only come back to land to nest. If they could have ever designed an egg that floated and could be brought up on the open ocean, they would have done it long ago. They can't. They have to come back to land. And so land is the place that they return to breed. In terms of their feeding, um, this hurts when I say this because I'm an albatross junkie, but I can tell you that albatrosses are pretty dumb. They, they really are pretty dumb. Uh, it just so happens that their prey is dumber, and that's the, that allows them to exist. When they are out feeding, if you can imagine driving your car and looking for roadkill, that's how an albatross looks for food. It only feeds on the top surface, it does not dive down. Deepest diving penguin is an emperor penguin, can dive to depths of 2,072 feet, hold his breath for 18 minutes at a time. 
Albatrosses do not do that. Albatrosses are surface feeders. They exploit the top part of the ocean. And so when they're flying along like this, they cover up to five, 600 miles in a single day. They're looking for roadkill. If they find anything that's floating, it's dead. They're scavengers. If they see something that's alive and needs uh, dealing with, they'll fly past it, they'll circle it. They do nothing with great precision. They come in, they put their undercarriage down, and this is them coming in. And those huge feet that you see, those huge, huge feet skid to a halt on the water. There's a big splash. As I say, there's nothing stealthy about an albatross. They are dumb. They are so dumb. Just so happens that the squid is dumber. The squid sits there. Some of these squid are four and five feet long. That's when the big, huge bill comes into play. And the albatross gets hold of the, the, uh, the squid and literally bludgeons it to death with that huge bill. That bill is over seven inches in length, folks. It's a huge bill. And they won't bother dismembering anything. So they'll get hold of sometimes a four or five foot squid. They subdue it, they get hold of it, and they have huge gapes. The gapes are very, very large, and will go all the way back here, halfway across the head, so that they can handle huge food. And I've seen them take a four and a half foot squid, and they just... and they suck it in, in one go. One of the great joys is uh, rescuing birds down in the southern hemisphere and having albatrosses under your charge. And you have a bucket you can barely lift. It's full of squid four or five feet long. You lift the squid out and you just hold it over the albatross. It opens its head up in half because of the big gate. And you just drop a four foot squid. It's gone. These are albatrosses. They are bizarre, bizarre birds. So the big albatrosses tend to take big squid, whereas the smaller albatrosses tend to take very much smaller squid, and this is how they divide up their resource. And we call this resource partitioning. And you can see there, and I'll point out again, that one little gate line, this goes all the way back, the head opens in half, and I can't emphasize that enough. I've seen small albatrosses take hold of pintado petrels and swallow them <coughs> in one go. And this pintado petrels have three foot plus wingspan, so that gives you an idea of just how uh, good these birds are at uh, eating big prey items. And that's all because of the big wide gate they have. Feeding over, they turn, they face the wind. They have very powerful feet. You saw in the photograph just three or four ago, the big feet that they have. And they use those big feet to run across and then get airborne and off they are once they've been feeding. Some of the other features that albatrosses are known for, folks, is longevity. And this really is something that surprises many people. We often think that we're the only things that live to 60, 70 or 80 years, but that certainly is not true. Albatrosses are the longest lived of all birds in the wild. And to give you an idea on how long they live, for many years, this was Grandma, a celebrated New Zealand Northern Royal Albatross. And she lived at Tyora Heads, just south of Dunedin, uh, on South Island. And she was banded as an adult bird in 1937. She might have been 20 years old, but she was certainly 10 years old. And she failed to come back in 1989. She was at least around 65 to 90, sorry, 65 to 70 years of age. And in her 60 or so years, she had four husbands and she had 13 children. And as I say, she failed to come back in 1989. Nowadays, we have another albatross that has taken over from her currently. And this is a Laysan albatross called Wisdom. Wisdom is an absolute star. She was banded again as an adult bird. We don't know, she could have been 40 years of age, but she was banded in 1956. She was at least 10 years old. That puts her year of hatching out at around 1946, which is, funnily enough, when I was born. So it's very easy for me to tell you that she's now exactly 77, and believe it or not, she's nesting again, she's got another new husband, and in her 77 years, she has raised 37 chicks. Can you imagine that? These are, these are very, very successful birds, as long as they're not introduced predators, plastics and stuff that are going around, catching on long lines. 
So without the interference of man, these are very, very uh, 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 good birds for surviving uh, into their adult years. So wisdom, around 77 years of age. And you can see two chicks there, folks. They leave their chicks in creches, and then she has to go through and she has to find her chick, and they identify each other by voice. So she, this is the wisdom looking for her chick. The other thing about albatrosses is their uh, a tendency to wander very vast distances. And so um, we always suspected that these birds would fly five or 600 miles. In the last 20 years with transponders, data loggers, and other such stuff, we've been able to actually track them for the first time. And we now know that there's some really amazing facts. Our champion flyer in the albatross um, uh, group is the Northern Royal Albatross. It's one of the smaller great albatrosses, still with a wingspan of about eight and a half feet. And this bird, or one of them anyway, with a transponder on it, flew a staggering 1,100 miles in 18 hours. 1,100 miles, think about that. That is really quite something. In terms of circumnavigating the Earth, the gray-headed albatross from South Georgia na navigated, left South Georgia, and flew completely around the world and was back at its nest in 42 days. And if you look at things like the wandering albatross, we know from transponder work and satellite work that these birds fly between five and 600 miles in a day. Do the math. They live for 70 to 80 years. There are 365 days in a year. You'll come up with about 10 million miles that they're flying. And to put that into real perspective, that's about 18 journeys round trip to the moon and back. Think of the frequent flyer miles you would each have if you could be an albatross. So these albatrosses have no real, uh, no, no, no real fear of traveling vast distances. And then, of course, I've mentioned size a lot. That's not actually that much bigger than what the, the albatrosses really are. They are immense birds. I spent most of my time on the decks of a ship looking and pointing out and saying to people that really is 11 feet or 12 feet wide. It's just that there's no scale out there. We had a Chevrolet out there, a London phone box. You would just see how big these birds are. And the only way that you ever, ever, ever appreciate the enormity of an albatross is to get hold of one. And then you get some idea of just how big these birds are. They are immense birds. So they are the oldest birds in, on Earth in terms of uh, living, uh, definitely just 60 to 80 years of age, they're capable of. They are the biggest birds in terms of wingspan, certainly the bigger albatrosses, and they're also the most itinerant. Okay, I'm often asked, do you have a favorite bird? And yes, I do, and it's on the screen right at this moment. And that is a uh, light mantle sooty albatross. In fact, in this photograph, there are three of my most favorite things. There's the albatross on the left, there's my Canon camera in the middle, and my wife Shirley on the right. And Shirley, I know that you're in here somewhere, darling, and I don't mean in that order necessarily. So let's, let's just say that. The light mantles for the albatross, my favorite bird, is a bird that is small, only about six feet across, weighs about seven or eight pounds, but it is an absolutely beautiful, beautiful bird. Just look at that, chocolate brown head, silver back. And I want you to look at that eye. If you are an albatross junkie, and many people are, I'm definitely an albatross junkie. Some people are penguin junkies, but remember, real birds fly. So, <laughs> I, I get so much grief when I'm down in Antarctica, you know. So anyway, uh, here we are with our light mantles for the albatross. And if you're a junkie, what you want is to take, get up close and you can walk right up to these birds, as close as I am to some of you. And what you do is you have to photograph the eye. And if you can photograph the eye and then look carefully and you get your reflection in the eye of the albatross. This is what every albatross junkie wants when they go down to South Georgia. It's a very easy shot to get, but uh, you have to get to South Georgia to do it. Notice that they have an all black bill and they have this blue stripe. This is a salsus on the bird's lower mandible. So this is the light mantle to the albatross. They're small, they're agile, they're very, very adept, very nimble. And when it comes to flying, 
they come, can come in, they can collapse and store onto a ledge, and when they want to then fly off, they just turn, put their backs to the cliff, they respond to Newton's beckoning finger, they throw themselves off the cliff, and then gravity do the rest. They open their wings and off they go. One of the great thrills I get by going to places like South Georgia is to look at these albatrosses and just sit, sometimes spending an hour just sitting on the cliff and watching them as they go up and down the cliff. Because they nest on narrow cliffs, they can't do much courting, dancing like the other albatrosses. So most of their courting is done in the air with these wonderful aerial ballets. The birds calling in flight and the male eventually landing on the ledge and then calling the female in with its wonderful calls. They are one of the most vocal of albatrosses. They take their bill, they put their bill between their legs and they come up with a and they clack their bills together. And this is how they bring each other. The male brings the female down onto the ledges. The Tristan Islanders call them the Piaz because of that wonderful call that they have. So these are the smaller albatrosses and cliff nesting albatrosses. Once the male gets the female in, the male is the one with its back towards you, slightly larger. That's the case of all albatrosses, males being larger. And what they do is that they look at each other and they then fence bills and they let fly with these wonderful, wonderful uh, calls that they have, these PR calls. I remember many years ago, this would have been a shot taken in the 1980s down in Antarctica, and we had been out on a morning's run with our zodiacs, and we'd been looking at king penguin colonies um, that morning, and we'd had a wonderful time. We didn't see just these penguins in twos and threes and fours, but literally wall to wall. More so, more closer than you are spread out in front of me at the moment. And when I say wall to wall, I mean wall to wall. This is a king penguin colony. You can see countless thousands of these birds. And you know, we often exaggerate. You know, you say they stretched as far as the eye can see. And you know, that is an exaggeration most of the time. But in South Georgia, that's not an exaggeration. That's a king penguin colony. How many of you have been to South Georgia and the Antarctic? I know many of you have. Oh boy, there's a lot of virgins here. <laughs> you really have to go to South Georgia, folks. I really cannot tell you enough. If this light mantle city albatross is my favorite albatross, let me tell you, South Georgia is my favorite place on earth. I keep going back there because if I die anywhere, I would like to die in South Georgia. But if I was told that I had just five days to live, I can tell you, or seven days to live, five of them would be in South Georgia, definitely. And you might say, well, what about the other two? Getting there. <laughs> I honestly do believe that if God ever takes a holiday, he surely takes it at South Georgia. Sell your car and mortgage your house. Every one of you in this room should get down to South Georgia. Anyway, I digress. Let me go back to the albatrosses. Um, so this is South Georgia. This, by the way, is Salisbury Plain, and that's just a modest colony of around 60 or so thousand pairs. Some of our colonies are over a million birds when you take the three, uh, two parents and the, the chicks, so a million birds on some of these bigger colonies. So we've had a tremendous day out, or morning at least, with the king penguins. We were getting wonderful images that would grace National Geographic magazines and so forth. And we were gonna be coming back to that same beach that afternoon. And so we were loading the boats to go back for lunch. And then I heard the call of the one, uh, sorry, of the light mantles of the albatross up in the hills behind me. And looking up, I saw several of them were flying around, displaying to each other. So remembering that Chinese proverb, it was Confucius that said that he that is ruled by his stomach is a fool. I turned to the expedition leader and I said, hey, listen, listen, come and pick me up after lunch and I'll do the afternoon tour. I said, but uh, rather than lunch, I'm gonna go up and sketch some, uh, some albatrosses. He said, sure, and so off he went. And I scrambled up the, the grassy knolls and was soon with the albatrosses on their wonderfully uh, narrow grass nests in all that lovely power grass. And I sat next to about four or five of them, and they were all screaming and managing to get females to come and land next to them. And I got my sketch pad out, and I was sketching away and taking photographs of this bird. And as hard as it would try, it could never ever seem to get a female to land next to it. Now knowing that these birds love to be tickled on the side of the head, 
I got fairly close and I thought to myself, well, I'll cheer it up. It looked pretty la lost and sad. And I reached out with my hand and just on the cheek, I just started to tickle it on the cheek. The bird went into absolute ecstasy. It started to shiver and it put its head down between its legs. My undoing was that I put my head down between my legs. And in the sexiest voice that I could muster, I let fly with a yeah! So help me, the bird ran around behind me and tried to mount me. I can't make this stuff up. It was the biggest compliment that any bird has ever given me. And I prefer to think it was a female. Okay. So much, so much for our albatrosses. You now know that they are mostly found in the southern hemisphere. There are 22 species, 18 are in the south, four in the north. I'd like to end our little talk here today with uh, the life history of the largest of them all, and that's the wandering albatross, because it is so bizarre, it is so wonderful, and it's one of the greatest survival stories in the world of natural history. So I want you to believe that you've shed these clothes that you've got on, you've got a suit of feathers on, mostly down. You've been sitting in a nest for around 276 days, and these big white birds have been coming and visiting you during the time of winter when the snow is there, a lot. And you've been fed throughout the winter and then into the spring. And these two big white birds, adult birds, have been feeding you. And then as spring broke into summer, they stopped. And you were left. They fed you that last time, and you were left as a youngster on the island. This is a feature of all tube nosed birds, doesn't matter what you are storm petrel, shear water, diving petrel. All tube nosed birds deserve their youngsters. It's great. Independent kids were immediately, you know. So some birds spend a year or more bringing up youngsters, but not the tube noses. So the adults deserve the youngsters. And the goonies, as they're called, the young albatrosses, are left out on the, uh, the islands. Eventually, they're going to get so hungry that they will make that fateful decision, and they'll launch themselves off a cliff, and they'll head for the open sea. I want you to imagine that. This is a young bird that's been on the nest site for about 280 days. It's, it has no guidance from its parents, and it goes out over the open ocean and begins a journey that will last at least eight to 10 or even 12 years before it ever re returns to land. And it pits itself against the Southern Ocean, the windiest, stormiest, most savage seas in the world. And they go out and in their first year alone, they have to work out where the food is. They have to work out how to fish for squid, mostly at night. And they have to evade long liners and other such things that will cause them serious injury. So they go out to sea, and this is how they look. This is a goonie, a young bird. Notice that it's got all brown underbody, it's got white underwings, and it has this white clown-like face. Using transponders, we follow these birds, and believe it or not, unaided, unguided, in their first year at sea, they fly 185,000 kilometers in their first year at sea. They'll be at sea for some 10 or 11 years, and by the time they return to start breeding as a young adult, they will have covered sometimes over 2 million miles without ever touching land. The sea is their home. And as they get older, they get a little bit whiter each time. You can see the belly beginning to get white here. They'll end up with a breastband. And then eventually, this is what they will look like. Imagine what that must feel like. Here you are, a young albatross. You're out at sea for the first eight to 10 years. You avoid land because of the dangers of land. You spend your entire time at sea, and then those terrible things called hormones take over. They force you, they force you to go back to your natal island. What must that be like? To come flying in, this is a male, it's whiter than the female, and you look down, this is the first time you've returned to your island, you look down and there are people down there, people on the headland. Of course, I do mean albatross people, and these are young albatrosses that are looking for partners. You might circle three or four times, you might go back to sea, you might take another week to come back in, but eventually the urge is too great. You come in over the displaying albatrosses, you put your undercarriage down, 
and in you come. Now, just think about this. I've said that albatrosses are klutzes. You know, sometimes they'll come in and they'll hit the ground, they'll do two somersaults, three somersaults. We often say, we albatross researchers, that any landing an albatross walks away from is a good one. <laughs> and so that lovely power grass often acts as a, a, a pillow, cushions the effects, and in they come, they land, they turn over somersaults, and you're still not quite sure why you're here. If you look carefully, this bird is bigger and whiter. This is a male, this is a younger female, and this is another female. Look at the darkness of the wings here. And so just when you're thinking what you're here for, there's a bird somewhere on the right, it will put its wings out, it will put its head down between its legs, and it will then start with a very exaggerated, slow-moving head shake, and then start neighing like a horse, and then finish with a beautiful sky point. And it's then that you know why you're here. This is the singles bar. This is the debutante ball, and you've come, you've flown for 10 years to come in to land. And this is how you start your breeding regime. So these are the wandering albatrosses. They make these big uh, uh, groups of birds. You can only see three here. But when you think of these birds, sometimes we can have 20 birds. And you can imagine, I wouldn't be able to fit 20 birds on this huge stage because they're 10 or 12 feet from wingtip to wingtip. And as they come in, so that the wings go out, the horse-like neighing, and this is one of the most amazing bird displays anywhere on Earth. I've taken many celebrities up to see albatrosses, especially in South Georgia. Perhaps one of my favorite people that I ever took up was the actor Jimmy Stewart. And when Jimmy came down on our ship, he was already very frail, very thin, and not very strong. But he heard about albatrosses and he particularly wanted to see wandering albatrosses displaying. So the piano player, David Kaplan and myself, we got hold of a stretcher from the sick bay. We put Mr. Stewart on the stretcher and we walked with him through a couple of streams up to the top of Tryon Island. And there were the albatrosses displaying. That photograph was taken on that day. And Mr. Stewart looked at us and he said, Peter, this is perfect. He said, put me on that piece of grass. And we put him on a grass stump and he sat as though he was in a green throne. And he sat there and he said, come back in an hour. We left him there for an hour and we came back. And as I approached him, I could see that he was quite upset, but in the nicest sort of way. And he held out his hand and his hand was trembling and he was shaking. And he said, Peter, my friend, he said, this was some of the best moments of my life. He said, Hollywood could never put on a show like this. That was Jimmy Stewart and his appraisal of the wandering albatrosses. So just think of the wanderers. You're all young birds. You've got to work out who's who and who's going to be your partner. Remember, these birds pair for life, barring death or divorce. And they do get divorced, but we won't go into that. Um, they do get divorced, uh, but barring death and divorce, they will form a pair, long bond, for the rest of their lives. They learn how to dance like an albatross, they learn how to kiss like an albatross, and they start off as a group, and then if you look down through the hillside a few weeks later, you will see that there's a pair here, this is a young pair, another young pair here, another young pair here, but these white dots that you see, these are adult birds' experience that are already on a nest, already with an egg under, and incubating the eggs. So these are young birds, it's important for you to choose a nest. These birds are 12 feet across, they weigh 25 pounds. They need 25 to 35 knots of wind to come and take off and land safely. So that's what these birds are looking for. A nest where it's windy more times than it is not. And so this is one of the greatest birding displays any, of any species of bird in the world. And so they trample an area flat, they choose where they're gonna make a nest, and then they'll spend the next two to three years coming and going and getting used to that nest and getting used to each other. It's in probably about their 12th year that the wandering albatross male comes back. He's normally first back. And as he comes in, he lands, he takes up, stance onto his nest, and then he waits for his female. Sometimes they wait 20 days. Sometimes they might wait only a day or two. On average, it's about seven days or so that they're waiting. They'll look up and they will see their female coming in. 
I'm a very good artist, or a reasonable artist, maybe I shouldn't say very good, but um, I'm pretty good at looking at birds and looking out for details so that I can identify individuals, but I still can sometimes identify the individual males and females from each other. But the, the male can, and here's the alb albatross female coming in. They haven't seen each other for about 10 or 11 months. She lands, maybe does a somersault, he puts his wings out and does an ecstatic uh, braying, and what he's actually saying is, yes, baby, welcome home. <laughs> she lands, she comes, she walks, the male curtsies, puts his wings out like this, and then, just as I would give Shirley a kiss if I'd been away for a business trip, they then rub bills together, and this is the start of when they will really be trying to raise a chick for the very first time. It's an intense program. They'll spend three to four weeks on shore most of the time, taking a few uh, visits offshore to feed. But this now becomes a very active time for the birds. Um, uh, bird displays do not get any bigger or better than this, in, in my opinion. And so the nest now is being built for the very first time. They had a small platform there, but now they're in earnest and that nest will get to be about 18 inches high. And then they're still doing, they're displaying backwards and forwarding, and it gradually builds to a crescendo, and then comes copulation. Copulation is a clumsy affair, it is in most birds, but in albatrosses more so. Uh, these birds spend about 40 seconds, and that's about once every two years, because they breed every two years. And from that 40 seconds of copulating, an egg is laid. It is not the biggest egg of any bird in the world. You all know that that's an ostrich. But it is the egg that takes the longest time to incubate. An albatross, wandering albatross, the egg takes between 76 and 84 days. So that's almost three months. So if you're going to sit on an egg for about three months, you need not a room with a view, but a nest with a view. And for those of you that are seabirders, you'll know of a man called Robert Cushman Murphy. He was my hero. He was an amazing guy. He was a biologist. He got married one afternoon and immediately set sail, leaving his wife on the shore that afternoon. He was a real biologist. And he set sail on a little ship called the Daisy, a brig, and he went down to South Georgia. The glacier in the distance there, you see the glacier over here. This is the Grace Glacier, or glacier. Um, Americans say glacier because it's racier, but we Brits say glacier because it's glacier. That's <laughs> just what you say. So here, here we are with the Grace Glacier right here, and this is uh, Bay of Isles over here. And Robert Cushman Murphy penned some immortal words. Although he left his wife on the day that they were married, he wrote to his wife on a regular basis. And in the end, they put a whole series of essays, his letters to his wife, and they called it simply Logbook for Grace. If you've never read it, you can purchase that, you go to Beauty of Books. And one of his essays was of his voyage from Montevideo down to South Georgia. And on the second day out, he saw his first albatross. And if you're an albatross junkie, you will know exactly what I'm going to say now in advance of me saying it. But he penned the words to his wife. I have now joined a higher cult of mortals, for I have seen the albatross. So for those of you that haven't seen an albatross, you need to elevate to a higher cult, and for that you will have to go south to South Georgia. So here's the bird sitting on its nest. They have a very long incubation, as I say, 76 to 84 days. Normally the stints are eight to 10 days, but you do get some which turn out to be up to 40. Um, and they can lose quite a bit of weight during these uh, long incubation stints. These birds sit very passively and they conserve their energy during the incubation period. Around about uh, day 60 to 70 in the incubation process, the birds normally become very agitated. They've been sitting on an egg, the egg hasn't done anything. But suddenly there's a chick inside the egg and now it's beginning to try to make a hole in the egg. The young albatross chick doesn't just hatch out of an egg, it takes seven to ten days. And as it's doing it, it's cheeping. Cheep, cheep, cheep. The albatross adults go beside themselves with uh, excitement. 
they're sitting on a talking egg. It's not done anything at all. Now there's an egg that's talking to them. They are beside themselves with excitement. They try to push each other off the nest. And you know, as a researcher, this is a big time for you as well. You've been checking that nest for almost three months. Now you can see the adults are excited. And when you see them, just out of the back of the, the adult, you see here a little bill that is sticking out from underneath the feather tips, and you now know that the egg is hatched. And if you get down on your hands and knees, and you creep forward, you'll find uh, Master Albert Ross just on the ground waiting, just underneath the, the, the female or the male, whoever's hatched it out. And he's stealing his first views at South Georgia, which even in the winter, folks, is an absolute mine of penguins. That's winter time, and you can see there the king penguins occur at their colonies year round, and that's a colony of about 80,000, which go all the way, by the way, all the way down to this dark area here. So this is all penguins. And of course, beautiful scenery that the bird is uh, subjected to as well. South Georgia, an island about 100 miles long, peaks, mountain peaks, snow capped, nine and a half thousand feet high, with 100 glaciers that tumble down to the waterway. And of course, beaches that are just filled with penguins, both kings and gen twos, and then also our elephant seals on the beach as well, as you can see. To start with, once the bird hatches, there's the guard stage, and this is true with all the albatrosses. And with the wanderers, it's about six weeks that the adult stays there with the youngster, making sure that it's protected from the weather and also from maybe passing predators like giant petrels. The young chick has a lot to say, it's eternally hungry. And I want you to notice that feeding is by regurgitation. This gives the albatrosses a tremendous advantage of birds that do not have regurgitation possibilities. If you think about it, maybe um, here in the United States to the north, uh, a bird that uses its bill as a shopping basket would be a puffin. And puffins, every year there's a contest to see how many fish a puffin has been holding. At the moment, a Canadian bird is the winning bird. It had 47 fish in its bill. But as soon as a puffin feeds itself and it's got a bill full of fish, it's got to fly back to the nest. So puffins feed their chicks every two to three hours. They have a, a feeding range of about maybe 50 kilometers, and that's about it. But when a wandering albatross leaves its youngster at the nest and it goes out to the open ocean, it flies not for days, but for weeks. Sometimes a single feeding trip will be 14, 15, or 20 days, and in that time frame, it will fly between 10 and 15,000 kilometers. This is not migration, this is a feeding trip, and it does feeding trip after feeding trip for the 278 days that the chick is in the nest. So this is really uh, a tremendous advantage for the albatross. It's able to store food in its preventer cooler, the upper chamber of the stomach, and it enables it to go out to sea for day after day and bring back big helpings of food to its very, very hungry chick. We've put transponders on our uh, albatrosses at South Georgia, and we now know that they fly up to the Brazil current, and that's around 8,000 to 12,000 kilometers round trip journey. Unfortunately, many of the feeding areas are also areas of commercial fishing, and up until quite recently, many of our albatrosses ended up on long lining hooks like this. It was absolutely tragic. And back in the 1990s to 2010, we embarked on a really great campaign. I worked with then Prince Charles, now King Charles, and um, we championed that cause together, and we managed to start to stop the, uh, the, the unwanted slaughter of these big albatrosses and small albatrosses, so much so that now we are seeing a recovery of our albatrosses, and it's all thanks to a change in some of the fishing habits. I want to make it quite clear that the food demands of a young albatross chick is so great that you can't be a one-income family. You have to be two parents to satisfy the growing chick. So, assuming that the chick and the adults are fine and no loss of uh, adults, the chick continues to grow. The first snows of winter come, and now productivity of the ocean begins to settle down, uh, but they still get fed, but just at longer intervals. You know, I was in the romantic era of research, and the romantic era of research can tell just walking around with a pencil and a notebook and one other item, 
And that other item was the most important part of your apparatus that you had, and that was a set of kitchen scales. <laughs> and you simply walked around with your scales, and every time you passed a bird, you, you had a nest number, and you weighed the bird, and this is how you got your data in the old days. Nowadays, it's all changed, but I prefer the old days, the romantic age. And you can see that this bird here is around 13 pounds, or about six, six kilos in weight, which is about half grown. So this is how they spend the winter. There are fierce storms in South Georgia in the winter, very, very fierce storms. Uh, wind blows at 50, 60 knots, horizontal snow, three, four, five feet of snow in an afternoon. Nests often get buried, but the albatrosses know that they have to stay in that same area. It's their only way that they will get a free meal. They look like French poodles with bills, and they are now around, this is one about eight or nine months, it's got about maybe three weeks to go, and look at all that down and fuzz coming off. Now, I'm an albatross man, I'm not a penguin man. Penguins, they're fine, but uh, albatrosses are, are much nicer in my opinion. And uh, it hurts me to say this, but after all this work, the longest incubation of any bird, uh, a youngster in the nest for 270 days, that our young albatrosses would be as cute as some of those penguin chicks down in Antarctica. This hurts me. They're not as cute as the penguin chicks. In fact, they're the dumbest, ugliest damn things you've ever seen in your life. They can barely stand on their legs. They hardly can walk. They're all black. They've got white clown-like faces. And I'm telling you, the adults, the adults are beside themselves. They take one long, hard look at what they've created and sit to say, what the hell have we produced here? They feed their chick one last time, and that is a big meal. They feed their chicks. The adults walk to the headland, up to the top, and then out to the open sea, and that's it. They desert their youngster. They go out to sea, and they'll be back after a sabbatical of about 11 months. So the breeding cycle takes about 13 to 14 months. They breed once every two years. Our youngster is left sitting there wondering what on earth has happened. Where are those big white birds that have been feeding it? But it's had its last free meal. It spends a lot of time looking out to sea and a lot of time exercising. Now with the fur and the fuzz almost all gone, it's just about ready to head to the open ocean. One of the things that I do and love is to take people to places like the Antarctic, like South Georgia, and try to instill in them the same passion, the same love that I have for places that are wild and really reached, places like South Georgia. A few years ago, maybe three years ago, three seasons ago, I was down with a small group in Antarctica and at South Georgia, and we were watching a small group, a small gown, as it's called, of albatrosses displaying. It was evening sun, the birds were bathed in this golden light, everything was going so well, it was fantastic. And then one of my groups suddenly turned and said, what's that? And he pointed behind us, and then coming out of the grass was a young goody. I was absolutely flabbergasted. This bird should have left about a month ago. I would have thought that all of the goonies would have fledged by now, but this would certainly have been the last bird on the island. And it came out with its wings raised. And the wind had been getting up all afternoon and was now blowing at about 20 knots. And it walked right past us and it stood on a small grassy headland. And with its wings open and looked out at the ocean, I turned to my group of people and I said, I've never been able to show people the first flight of an albatross. Could this be the time? Quick! And we all got and ran down past and then we got down over to here and we looked up and there was the albatross with its wings out and the wind getting up and it was just jumping up, jumping up, getting a little bit more confident with each jump. And I turned to my group and I said, put your shutter on fast speed and when this bird jumps, just keep that finger pressed and hope for the best. Hope that that little Japanese man is awake in there. And so that's what we did. We were down underneath that bird with his wings spread, and it jumped two or three times. And then I said, this is it, folks. And the wind started to whistle and rage, and it was a really good blow. And with that, the albatross jumped and was suddenly airborne. There were two people on my left that were still standing fully up. I shouted, duck. They hit the ground, and the albatross went straight over their heads. 
It was an absolutely unbelievable moment. There were only nine of us there that afternoon, but we let out a cheer that you would have heard in Alaska. We watched in absolute awe as that bird headed out to the open ocean, felt the wind underneath its wings, and then headed instinctively to the northeast. And so began perhaps the most remarkable survival journey of any bird on Earth. The first flight of a young goonie going out to the open ocean, pitting itself against the southern ocean, the world's most savage, turbulent, and roughest sea, as often as not, just as a speck of life against a raging mass of swirling water. It will then circumnavigate the earth year after year for the next eight, nine, 10, 12 years. And when it does return back to its natal islands, it will not be in the brown garb of a goonie, but in the pristine white of an ad hoc wandering albatross. Diomedia Exulans, the great sea warrior. Well, I guess I've blown my cover. I've been in love with albatrosses since I saw my first one over 50 years ago. And it doesn't matter whether I'm down on a breeding island, whether I'm standing on the decks of a ship, watching as they cross and recross the wake with their pier disgrace, or whether indeed they are doing some of their crazy antics on their breeding islands. When I see an albatross, I still see them with the eyes of a child. My mind is filled with wonder, with enchantment, with awe. After all, folks, these are not just birds. These are albatrosses, the ocean nomads of our misnamed home, planet Earth. Thank you so much. stop by and take a look at it. It's a remarkable work and obviously a lifelong uh, passion. So thank you for coming. Enjoy the rest of the, the weekend, which is hopefully one day tomorrow of great winds and lots of birds. I know there's a lot of excitement uh, for what might be seen and I'll hope to see you on the field. Thanks for coming.